This painting, one of Vermeer's earliest, 1657 or so, has more modifications in the course of work than most pictures by Vermeer. There actually was originally, by Vermeer, a man in the background uh, either leaving the room or coming forward. It's not clear, but it's there in x-rays. And instead of the chair in the foreground, there was a, a big dog looking back at him. And Vermeer, in his later work as well, but especially here, has edited the subject matter to make what's going on a little less obvious. So the man's eliminated, the dog doesn't draw attention to him. It's just a woman alone with this sweet smile on her face. And in to the upper left, if you owned this painting or you were really quite a sophisticated viewer in Vermeer's day, you see this baby leg in a painting on the wall next to a mask on the ground. Just enough to tell you that it's Cupid, the god of love, unmasked. And that's a kind of label or metaphor for the expression on her, her face. She's, she's dreaming of a romance and remembering the visit. And we're like the uh, owner of the house who's come home from work and is practically standing right on top of her. There's this very downward view on the tabletop and uh, intimate encounter, which is partly amusing and partly embarrassing, and for the male viewer, also quite seductive. There's a, a woman of uh, perfect age for marrying, an ideal woman in an ideal home, you could describe it. I often think of uh, Vogue magazine meets Architectural Digest in a painting like this, where you might have in uh, a, a, f a photograph, an ad in a, in a fashion magazine, a young woman who's 22 and she's standing in some 40th story apartment in Manhattan with glass walls and a perfect Gucci gown or whatever. And it's, it's real, but it's impossible at the same time. And uh, she is holding this gold-plated silver pitcher and, and basin. She's opening the window. She's been doing her washing up and makeup in the morning, a very private moment. There is a Spanish jewel case here with pearls on a blue ribbon, which would have been used to tie it around her neck. And then a map of the Netherlands, Holland, on the rear wall. And all of this perfectly balanced in a cone-like way within rectangles. There is a sense of peacefulness and harmony to this picture. And we would be a man, in a sense, dreaming about this subject, seeing it. Um, it's so naturalistic, you feel like you could walk into the painting but there's something about the picture, its design itself, which keeps you at a distance. And this version of it, our own pearl with a girl with a pearl earring, which we call study of a young woman, they both date around the same time, 1665. And the models are probably real. They could well be Vermeer's daughters. He had about eight daughters, at least four of which would have been about this age. This particular head is really quite individualized, whereas the girl with the pearl earring is much more conventionally beautiful. She probably was, um, but this face is uh, chosen for its curiosity. Below the model is probably real. This picture was not sold as a portrait. It's a figure of an interesting person in exotic costume. I wouldn't be surprised if in a Dutch inventory of the time, this would have been called a young woman a la Turk, or the Dutch word trony, which simply means face or expression, a la Turk, because Turkish would be the, the um, scarf in the hair and the shiny shawl wrapped around her, which is not Dutch dress at all. And the earring is, of course, in this case, and even more so in the girl with the pearl earring, surprisingly large. It would cost as much as the painting itself. It's probably imitation. There were uh, glass uh, pearl earrings made in Venice, and the Dutch must have had some of these. But it's, it's a kind of dress up in the studio 
to look like an exotic figure. It might be an old man in Turkish costume. It might be a beautiful young lady. So it's really an artistic subject and highly artistic style. In this painting of about 1664, the meaning is a bit more obvious than in many pictures by Vermeer. And I wonder if in this case, he really intended it more for the open market than for a particular collector. We have a young lady in an ermine jacket, probably a bit dressier than she would normally wear in the middle of the afternoon. She is strumming a lute and she's actually tuning it, which in this culture could well be a suggestion of the virtue of temperance, to moderate your feelings, to temper your emotions. This is something uh, a collector of a certain literary bent would uh, read into the picture. And she's looking eagerly out the window probably for a man to arrive in the immediate foreground. There's a shadowy, this area has gone darker with age, but there is a viola da gamba with a bow on it. And these oblong books are song books which are spilling across the table and there's even one on the floor. It's interesting now that the map is not the usual map of the Netherlands, but a map, map of Europe, which suggests a, a certain cosmopolitan flavor, perhaps a boyfriend who's been away in the merchant marine. And he will come in and they will play uh, actually a trio together, the two instruments, and sing together. And that will be a form of courtship that she is eager to see the allegory of the Catholic faith. In composition, it reminds us of the famous allegory of painting in Vienna, but that picture is highly illusionistic, which suits the subject matter to see how much art can achieve. And in this picture, Vermeer really shifts to a more abstracted style. The female figure, like our Statue of Liberty in New York, she's an allegory of the Catholic faith itself. And in an old Italian book on iconography, he describes faith as having the world under her feet. In other words, the Catholic faith dominates the world, which is a little ironic here since we're in a country that is officially Calvinist and objecting to Vermeer's own religion, Catholicism. She is looking upward at another sphere, a hollow glass ball, which was a decorative item in Dutch homes. You see them in some pictures quite different than this one, but it's meant to contrast to the earth. So the faith is adoring heaven with various ritual objects on this table, which has been converted to a kind of altar, a Eucharistic chalice. The book is probably not the Bible, but the Roman Missal, which is the guide to the celebration of the Mass, specifically of the Eucharist, which is a big bone of contention between the Catholics and Protestants. Of course, a, a crucifix, and in the back is the crucifixion scene. Something you don't expect in an ordinary domestic interior is a large piece of stone crushing a snake which is bleeding from the mouth. He is the devil, the serpent, and the stone is an expression of St. Augustine who said Christ is the cornerstone of the church. And of course he means the Catholic church. Nearby an apple with a bite out of it, original sin which uh, began the whole problem of humanity which required the sacrifice of Christ. The environment looks like we're in another room. The tapestry here, we see the front of the tapestry. In the case of the allegory of painting, it's the back of the tapestry. But this tells us that we're in a room here, the tapestry faces us, and this is another room as if revealed, as if you drew a curtain and see this different space. And it looks like an ordinary Dutch home that's been dressed up as a chapel on a rather temporary basis. You don't expect a tapestry serving as a rug on a floor or a panel of Spanish gilt leather that doesn't go to the ceiling, just looks tucked in there temporarily. And this, I think, is really an allegory 
of the state of the Catholic religion in the Netherlands, where they're required to worship in private. Such a painting could only be for a private Catholic collector. It's not devotional. It doesn't work as an altarpiece in a church. It's a very intellectualized take on the state of Catholicism at that time.